welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. This is Carly Stevens Books for all things writing, publishing, and indie author life. And I have a NaNoWriMo treat for us all today because I get to talk to uh, Michael LaRon. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Hi, Carly. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So um, before we get really get into the topic of writing quickly and doing that in a way that is still, you know, healthy and avoids avoids burnout. Um, I'm just going to read this bio, let people know a little bit about you. Um, so Michael, also known as M. L. Ron for, uh, is that based on genre lines, I assume? Um, yeah, yeah. Michael Ron for fiction, M. L. Ron for nonfiction. Okay, perfect. Um, has published over 90 science fiction and fantasy novels, as well as help self-help books for writers. His fiction includes the urban fantasy Good Necromancer series, the dark fantasy Last Dragon Lord series, and the futuristic science fiction Android X series. Currently, he writes primarily urban fantasy. His nonfiction books for writers include the best-selling Be a Writing Machine, which teaches how to beat writer's block forever, and The Pocket Guide to Pantsing, which explains how to write a novel without an outline, which I know a lot of people are going to be interested in, um, and how to do that with confidence. Uh, Michael also runs the award-winning YouTube channel Author Level Up with over 40,000 subscribers and 2 million views. Writer's Digest voted the channel one of the, quote, best resources for writers in 2020. Um, so there's there's more to your story, but I think we're going to I think we're going to get into that uh, as we talk here. So that's that's an impressive resume just right off the top. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's just sales marketing. Just gotta, you know, it, it's it's been fun for me. I I've been doing this for over a decade now, and I just I just like to have fun. And you know, I've been fortunate and and pretty blessed that, you know, it, it it's worked, and a lot of people like what I have to to offer. So it's it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell us a bit about how you first got into writing? Like, what spurred all of this on? Yeah, well, I've always been a writer. I've been writing books or writing stories since I was a kid. I think every writer who ever, ever come on your channel probably could say that. But um, most, I, I went, not not all. You most, kind of yeah, most. So it's it's a very common story. So it's probably not uh, a shock for you to hear me say that. But um, I, I went to college, majored in English, wrote short stories as my final thesis, and got out there and wanted to be a writer and and found. That it was pretty tough. I uh, tried to go the traditional publishing route, and uh, that wasn't working out. And uh, start working in insurance, and I was working a kind of a dead end job as a claims adjuster. Mm -hmm. And what one night in 2012, I went out on a dinner with my wife, and uh, we had a lovely meal. And later that night, I fell ill with what I thought was food poisoning, and it was. And I went to the hospital, and it was the food poisoning of the worst variety. And while I was at the hospital getting treated for the food poisoning, I picked up another bacteria. And lo and behold, I, it was a pretty close call. Um, I, I could have could have died from this bacteria. There was uh, an article that um, was released in the USA Today the week I got out of the hospital about this particular virus and how it was, or bacteria and how it was killing young people across the country in hospitals. Oh so I was pretty lucky. And I remember being on that hospital bed and just kind of having an epiphany, like, I want to be a writer. And mm -hmm. I got this really beautiful vision of, of being a writer and having a published book, a book, and just being so happy about that. And mm -hmm. I swore on that hospital bed that I would you know, bend the universe around myself to make it happen. And got out of the hospital, healed up, fortunately, didn't have any long-term issues. And right around that time was when I found out about self-publishing. Because uh, those who know history, right around 2012, that was uh, the height of the Kindle gold rush. Right. And I discovered that, hey, I don't need a publisher to publish me. I don't need the validation that I've been looking for. I'm just going to tell the stories I want to tell and and publish them. And if they sell, great. If they don't, then so be it. I, I kind of fulfilled my dream. And so published the first book, couldn't get enough. And now here I am. That That is... Incredible. I, I love that you, well, that you survived, first of all, <laughs> that sounds like an incredibly harrowing experience, but that it, it spurred you on to, to accomplish, you know, your, 
your dream it's so easy to forget that life is life is short you know you have you have this finite amount of time to to really do something if it's if it's what you what you long to do and and you've had the opportunity to do that many times over <laughs> um so why is it that you write so many books a year i mean you have a, a lot going on you have a a family you have a job you have these different um, social media kind of outlets so is it just a personality thing is it is it a financial strategy like what's the primary reason you write so much uh, all of the above and and primarily because i just enjoy it i you mm -hmm. when i'm sitting in a chair writing i'm having a blast and there's nothing else I, I I would rather be doing, and so mm. for me, it's it's fun. I enjoy it. it I just, I'm lucky enough that people all over the world that I don't know pay me money for what I do, which is great. And I, I am an achiever. I'm a serial achiever. Like I have to always be striving for something. So ninety books for me is just not enough. Like I, I, I want to hit a hundred and then when I hit a hundred, I want to hit a thousand. And so I'm always thinking about what's next. And so this profession somehow matches and just, just dovetails really nicely with my personality, which is mm -hmm. I'm always looking for the next thing, always thinking and strategizing about how I can be successful. And I don't rest on my laurels. I just like to, I like the journey. Like for me, it's never about the destination. It's about what I can learn, who I can meet how much fun I can have. And so that's what motivates me. So uh, yeah, the money's nice, but at the end of the day, yeah, I did this for a long time before the money ever happened. So the money's just a perk at this point. Hmm. So you're always looking forward. It's not so much what you have done, but what you are in the process of doing and, and what this enables you to do, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Because it's easy to rest on your laurels. It's easy to say, you know, I've published 10 books and I'm going to hang at home. I'm going to go home. That's it. You know, and I'm just not that kind of person. I, mm -hmm. I just, I always like to be growing because I, I feel like this is, this is a profession where you never really learn at all. Like you can learn a lot about the craft of writing mm -hmm. and you can learn a lot about business, but you're always still learning things. I mean, I have mentors who are much, much older than me, double my age, and they're still learning. And I just happen to find that exciting. Uh, it, there is some beauty in knowing that you're never going to arrive, but you have all these really exciting milestones along the way and pieces that you can pick up. And yeah, I, I'm with you there. So you're an interesting mix to me. Um, you have a strategic achiever kind of mindset on the one hand, um, but also you're you're a pantser. You do it for the joy of it. It sounds like you're not primarily motivated by say numbers or or things like that so do you for your for your books um do you have a set release schedule or are you more of a mood writer like i i feel like writing you know harder science fiction today but maybe tomorrow i want to do more of a you know urban fantasy humor you, you know like how how structured is your uh writing time, I guess, in that sense. It is not structured at all. And, and honestly, <laughs> Carly, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people that sh on paper should just not have a writing career. Like if there was anybody who could say, you know what, I'm not going to do this and that's it, that it would be me. So <laughs> I have a very hectic lifestyle. I mean, as you mentioned, I, I have a family, I've built a writing career while working a full-time job. I'm an, I'm an executive in the insurance industry. Um, I went to law school while I was getting a writing career, building my writing career too. So there were times where I just wasn't in front of my computer. And I realized- I mean, that's that like, the reality of life, right? Unless you were well, not going to it, sleep or something. It, it, exactly. You know, and I have a young child, you know, and I just think it's it, it's not, there, there are some things in life that you can, you can structure and, and you can say, you know what, I don't care. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do it. And- Writing sometimes for a lot of people, I imagine a lot of people listening to this is 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 not always one of those things. And so I realized at, at one point that I had to learn how to evolve my writing in order to be able to write. So I learned how to write on my phone. I learned 
dictation so that when I'm walking my dog, I can tell, tell my novels. I've learned how to ride on a plane, how to write in the backseat of an Uber car, all because I can write on my phone. And that has made a really big difference. So to, to kind of get back to your question, like what does my structure look like on a daily basis? It depends on the day. And no day is is the same. So there's some days where I can sit in front of my computer for two hours and get words in. There's other days where I just simply can't and I'm relying on my phone and on dictation. Um, and so that has been my reality for the last 10 years. Things have gotten a little bit better over the last couple of years. But, um, you know, with with all the things I had going on, I just I just made the commitment to to sit down and write whenever I could do it. So if it was 10 o'clock at night and I was dog tired, I would still pull out my phone and I would I would write a paragraph, even if a paragraph was all I could get. Um, if if it was, you know, I'm standing in line at the checkout at the grocery store and it's a long line at Target as uh, the lines seem to get longer and longer these days. And there's five people ahead of me. I pull out my phone and I, you know, just inch along the person in front of me as they move up and I write something. And over time, that has added up in a really big way to where, right. you know, I'm averaging, you know, anywhere from, you know, seven to, to nine novels a year. And I don't have a set release schedule. I just, I, I commit to writing when I have the time. Fortunately, I've made a lot of time for it because, you know, I, I could be on Facebook. I could be on YouTube. I could be doing all the things that we do on our phones. I don't, I'm, <laughs> I'm always writing. So, you know, I, I, I've made a lot of space in my life. It's a lot of hobbies I used to have that I don't have anymore because I, I focused on the writing. And so all that time over the years has added up and it, it you know, there are some writers who can do the, the rapid release on a schedule. It doesn't bother me that much because I still know that even in a bad year, I'm still going to publish at least five books. So it, it, it all kind of works out kind of a long answer to your question, but no, it all no, kind of works I've... out. I think the commitment to consistency is important, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of people listening who, you know, have a really hard time with that for circumstances, you know, aging parents, children, things like that. And so I, I, I just, I just want people to know that if you're not one of those people that sits down and writes every day, that's okay. It, it, it's not the end of the world. As long as you just have a commitment that you'll do it whenever you can. I think that's important for people to hear whether they tend to enjoy writing at speed, you know, or if they really need to marinate, you can still be a writer, even if you're not sitting there every day, like, like some people say you have to, it is about that. I, I, I totally am with you that it is about that consistency and that commitment. And that is one of the biggest differences between, from what I've seen, people who have written full books have published full books and then those who like wish they could and they they can <laughs> if they just decided yep. to to make that that commitment so you're writing constantly part of me is very inspired and part of me is utterly overwhelmed by the idea of of just stuffing writing into all those spare moments so what do you do to combat burnout? Like, do you do you carve out some times where you just don't expect anything from yourself? Or is it just that you you allow yourself to work on any sort of project you want? Or or what is it that, that helps you to avoid that? Yeah, I love that you asked that question because I get it a lot. And I've I over the last decade, I've seen and known a lot of writers who burn out. You know, they have really promising careers. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, you're asking the question, whatever happened to you know, so-and-so? I'll, I'll say two things. The, the first is when you have fun with what you write, you can't burn out. So if you're having the time of your life when you're sitting in the writing chair, it's impossible to burn out. I mean, how can you burn out? You're, you're, you're telling stories that you love. You're, you're gallivanting with characters in your head. You know, it, it, it's, it's really, really difficult where people go off the rails is they start writing in genres that they don't care about. So they, they write stories that they think they have to write because they think that that's, what's going to make them money. Mm -hmm. And when the money doesn't come, they give up, or this is a worse scenario. When the money does come, they feel so handcuffed to the genre. Mm -hmm. They wake up one day. And they say, ah, I don't want to write this anymore. And so they want to write something else, like a brontosaurus romance or something. And then readers don't follow them. And so then right. they really burn out 
because it, then it becomes an existential crisis of why am I doing this, right? And so when you're writing the stories that you love and you build a, a platform of readers who are willing to pay you based on that, that's to me the best insurance policy against burnout. Um, the second thing I'll say with burnout is also being kind to yourself. Yes. So we all go through seasons of life where we are more productive and we are less productive. A few years ago, I was probably the most productive I've ever been in my writing career. Then some things happened. Um, th earlier this year, I had some health challenges where I had to step back from my writing for a little while. I'm fine, but I had to step back for a little while to take care of myself. And what I could have done at that point was I could have chosen to not step down and just keep charging along like everything was okay. That's that's going to lead you to burnout because that's your body telling you, listen, you got to take care of yourself. So when I, when I chose to not do that, when I chose to step aside for a few weeks and just take care of myself, the writing business kept going, you know? And when I, when I came back to the desk, I was in so much of a better position to pick up where I left off because I had a clear mind and a clear body and a clear spirit. So I think a lot of it as well is learning how to be kind to yourself when life strikes you're ill, family members are ill, the people that maybe you're caring for, such as children or aging parents are ill, you're going through a busy season at work. That's just life. And we talked about a commitment to consistency. As long as you're writing when you can, the mathematics are always in your favor, hmm. right? So a, a writer is somebody who writes. You can give up if you want, but you can always start writing again. And it doesn't matter if, if you haven't written for a day or two days or a year you can still pick up where you left off and nobody's going to judge you. Right. And so just being kind to yourself and not because so many people place really high expectations of themselves. Like I have to make a hundred thousand dollars this year within two years. And, and I've only ever sold two books, but I have to do it because <laughs> I hate my job and I hate my boss. And if this book doesn't work out, then my career's finished. I mean, when you put those sort of expectations on yourself, you're just asking to burn out. Uh, I think your writer spirit just wants to be free. It wants to be able to exercise its own its own will. Now, that doesn't mean that if you write the books that you love, that you're going to automatically make money. No, there's a tuition that you've got to pay. You've got to learn how to write. You've got to learn how to tell stories. You've got to learn the business and the marketing side of it. And you're going to make a metric crap ton of mistakes, as I have. But at the end of the day, when you do reach success, it'll be so much more long lasting and so much more full because you did it the way that you wanted to do it and you stay true to yourself. So that's just what I would tell people about burnout. I uh, that's that's good to hear. It it's so easy to to put those high expectations, maybe not quite that high. I know some people do, but um those high expectations on on yourself when so much of being a writer should be about the joy of it. Readers can tell, you know, if you love the characters and if you love the stories you're telling and and it's not just for, you know, some some other goal that you're trying to meet. Right. So that's that's a good a good reminder for <laughs> for me. Well, it's um, easy to forget because, you know, the more books is. you have, the the more the more you've got to run a business and the more you've got to do marketing and the more readers you have, and you've got to keep them happy. Mm -hmm. And it can be easy to forget why we do this in the first place. Right. Right. But just to go back to, back to the basics and keep returning to what do, what, why are we doing this? What did draw us to this, this profession in the first place? Um, so for people who, who do have maybe similar looking, lives they're they are very busy but they're they're ready to make that commitment and maybe this november nanowrimo is like their first time that they're going to intentionally write every day um what tips would you give to somebody who has say half an hour <laughs> how how would you advise them to make the most of that time and actually get some writing done yeah so let's take this by a couple of different groups. So if you are a writer that has never published anything 
and you're doing NaNoWriMo, your first focus should be getting the words down. That is the most important thing that you can do. Don't be sloppy about it. I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of not writing sloppy. I, NaNoWriMo is one of those things where I love NaNoWriMo, but I don't like the sloppy part of NaNoWriMo mm -hmm. because if you spend an entire month writing crappy, you're going to spend a lot longer than a month cleaning it all up. And that's mm -hmm. not efficient. So I, that's just how I'm built, how I'm wired. But focus on the words. Focus on telling a story. You're never going to, your first novel, you're only going to write once, right? And once you get that first novel written, the second novel, infinitely, it's, it's infinitely easier. All right. It's not cakewalk, but it's infinitely easier. You at um, least so know that you can do it because you've done it once. Exactly. I think there's something it, about that makes it easier for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so that's what I would tell for those writers. If if you are, if you've got a few books under your belt, or you've been doing this for a little bit longer, and you want to start committing to being more consistent, then I would still focus on the words. That still would be the most important thing. But don't neglect, as you get closer to publishing your book, don't neglect the the business and the marketing. Right. So then you have to start thinking about allocation. So as you get closer to publishing your book, start thinking about, you know, 80% of your time should be spent writing. 20% of that should be spent toward creating your website or, you know, learning how to create an email list, that sort of thing. Because often what happens is we focus so much on the words that the marketing becomes an afterthought. Mm. Right. So just think, you know, think about which of those two camps you fall into, but really just focus on the words, but don't, don't let November 30th be the end, right? So if you do want to continue writing every day, what can you start writing after November 30th? And if it, you know, I, I treat every month like it's NaNoWriMo really, but you know, not everybody, not everybody wants to do that. <laughs> that's, that's stressful and overwhelming for some people, but some people who are wired like me will relate to that. But um, yeah, NaNoWriMo is a great opportunity and, and enjoy it. And, and just remember that there's, it's a big wide world out there. And there's, there's a lot to learn, even when you're done writing. Right? Yeah, I, I personally, I do not spend every month like it's NaNoWriMo, but but sometimes, you know, about like two months a year, probably, I, I'll, I'll, I, I will either win NaNoWriMo or I would have if that if there were some <laughs> competition thing going on, then. Yep. But then there yep. are these big swaths of time when I don't get as many as many words done. So, uh, is there? Do you do you think there is a? You've kind of alluded to this already, but a healthy limit for those who do want to write faster and, you know, they want to teach themselves to have more words per hour. And like, are there any cautions oh, yeah. that you would give to somebody who is just like, all right, let's, let's get this going as fast as we can. I have a few cautions, but I have mostly encouragements. Okay. I, I all right. I mean, I, give it, yeah, give them both. I, <laughs> so first and foremost, your writing speed is your writing speed. Don't compare yourself to other people. Mm -hmm. So just because Sim Jimmy and Susie can write 5,000 words per day, that doesn't mean that you need to write 5,000 words per day. If, if you're at 500 words per day, that is a fantastic number because if you do the math, just whatever your daily word count is, just do the math, multiply it by 365, and it'll be bigger than you think. Right. And then divide that number by 50,000. And that's the number of novels you can write per year. So the math is always in your favor. People just never do the math. All right. So if you're at 500 words per day, I think that's a fantastic number. Um, I think 100 words per day is a fantastic number. I think anything over that is a fantastic. There's no number that's not a fantastic number except zero. <laughs> <laughs> right. So whatever your number is, figure out how you could increase that by 10%. Okay, so if you can, you can write 500 words per day, what would it take for you to write 550 words per day? All right. And, and then once you get to 550 words per day, and you can hold that for two weeks, what would it take to get to 650? And you keep doing that until you break. And then what you do is you back off just a little bit. And that is your new equilibrium. All right. Hmm. Now, here's the thing. There are, there's always going to be a limit 
to what you can write. So for example, a lot of people, they just, they, they sit in front of the computer and type. Well, okay, how fast are you typing? Can you learn how to type faster? Okay, so some people are, you know, doing the hunting and pecking. Right. You know, and, and that's, that takes forever. Takes forever. And so maybe you need to sit down and take some keyboarding classes. I'm sure you could find some online. Okay. I know that sounds really basic, but it really does. It really does make a difference because I type really fast. I had a, an excellent keyboarding teacher in middle school who taught me how to type really fast. Mavis Beacon even, taught me back in the day. <laughs> those, yeah. Like teachers typing, you know programs it, it, exactly exactly <laughs> so so i i that that was a skill that i you know he taught me how to do that and i i i never realized how valuable or invaluable it would be when i grew when i grew up but there's only a limit to how fast you can type all right so for those people you know figure out what that is first and then you can start exploring some some of the dark side which is like dictation right the dark, so the dark I, side like the rogue side of of, oh, the dark. It's completely okay. dark. I mean, you're, you go into a black hole and you never, you never, or better yet, I should say, you go into a magic box and what, what goes in doesn't resemble at all what comes out <laughs> once you learn dictation. So I've okay. done lots of videos on dictation. Um, I did an hour long uh, course on, on it. It, it. You know, I'd be happy to send the link to you for anyone who wants to watch it. But um, dictation's not for everyone, but for those people, it's for you can double or triple your word counts overnight. So the average person types, I think like 150 words per minute. Um, the average person speaks like two or three times more than that. So just by virtue of learning how to tell your stories, you can double, triple your word counts. And then you can start to do crazy stuff like I do where I have a voice recorder and I have a little microphone. And when I'm walking my dog, I just speak my story and then I come home and upload it into my computer and, you know, it's all there ready for me to edit. So that's advanced if you want to learn dictation. But there are ways to, to, to be able to write, you know, upwards of 2,500 words a day. I mean, just as a reference, if you write, I believe it's 20, it's like 2,700 and change words per day. If you do that every day, that'll get you a million words. Now, most people are probably thinking, oh, my goodness, that is crazy. You don't have to do that. But, you know, shoot for the stars and that, that's shoot really, for the moon and you land among the stars, it, right? Right. Is is that? Oh, I'd have to, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to check that. that yeah, depend, depending, thought, on how, that feels... depending on how you count it. Yeah, it's, it's a big, it, you know, it's a big number. I mean, it, just the thought of writing more than 2,000 words a day is enough to send a lot of people screaming. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, if you could, if you could learn how to, another way you can learn how to write faster is not learning how to write sloppy. So mm -hmm. if, if, if it were true, and this is true of a lot of professional writers, they've learned how to do this, myself included, you can learn how to write a good story that is fantastic, that readers will love, and you can learn how to do it in one draft. And that's a scary proposition. That's something I had to work myself up to. I, I could not start that way. But for people that want a little bit of motivation, that that's a North Star that you could to do. So if you're one of those people that write that takes 10, 10 drafts to write a book, you know, th that's okay. But what, what would it take for you to do, to create a book with the same level of quality in five drafts? And then how do you cut that down to three? And then you can get down to one because we eat up so much time in revision. And so if you can reduce the amount of time that you're spending revising while still creating a quality story and mm -hmm. still pushing yourself to the, the best of your ability and your limits as a writer, then you're automatically going to write faster. I mean, it, it, it'll save you so much time. It's, it's not even funny. Because you're shaving off some of those, those editing passes that, that do take a lot of, a lot of time. Interesting. Yeah. I was, I was about to, I was about to argue that that would depend on genre you know, I, I write in a variety of genres and some are really quick to write and they sometimes one draft is all it takes, seen them. And then other ones I've had to go back. But I was but then I thought even more historical works, you know, you are going to need some editing passes there, but how could you cut those down? The 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 ideas 
do still apply. Nice. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I mean, historical, a lot of the rules go out the window with historical fiction. It, it, it's not that it can't. Yeah, there's research and things you have to do. And and when I say write a novel in a draft, one draft, what I don't mean is write the words and then slap the end on it and you're done. Actually, it's a process. Um, Dean Wesley Smith, if you've heard of him, he has a process. It's called Writing into the Dark. And my book, po The Pocket Guide to Pantsing, is kind of based on that. And it's basically you when you sit down to write, you write like 500 words and then you stop and you review the 500 words, and then you pick up where you left off. And it's a process that he calls cycling. And so hmm. essentially what you're doing, you're not really, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a trick. You're not really writing the novel in one draft. You're actually making multiple passes, but you're doing it as you go. And th the rationale behind that is that hmm. you will never be closer to the story than when you immediately write it. So hmm. by going back and, and doing the revision as you go, it does slow you down just a little bit, but you save so much time in the long run because you're not having to go back and do the deep, deep revision and editing passes. So right, the, the additions it, it's, it's, and all that. Exactly. Yes. It's, it's, it's an efficiency play. So, so much about, about writing and being prolific is about being extremely organized and extremely efficient. Hmm. And I know that that sounds really weird, um, but it's it's absolutely true because the more organized you are in your writing process, the easier it becomes for you to repeat that. So once you can start repeating it, then you know you you can get it down to a science where you tell the story, you do the work that you need to do to make sure that you know your characters are good, your story's good, you're connecting with readers, you know your your prose is good as well, and. You know, you, you, you have a book sooner than you think. So that's actually the perfect segue to uh, my last question. I mean, I want to know so much more, but, you know, have to have to bring this to a close at some point. You mentioned the uh, book that you wrote, The Pocket Guide to, to Pantsing. Pantsing, um, yep. Yeah, so especially for people who are newer writers, you know, maybe they haven't finished their first book or they've written one book and they're working on their second they 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 can be all gung ho at the beginning. The excitement is there. They can write all these words, and then they hit the middle, and they're not sure what to do with it. So, for those people, what what tips have you found, or what was a breakthrough moment for you to to realize that the middle is just as exciting as everything else? And here's here's how I got to that point. Yeah, it happens well before the middle. So it, it actually happens somewhere around the one third mark. So, so what happens, what you said, you know, gung ho, that's a perfect word. People start off just super enthusiastic about the novel. It, it feels great. You know, everything you're writing is wonderful. And then slowly the clouds start to roll in and things start to get dark. It starts raining. And then you doubt everything you've written up <laughs> until that point. And I call that the honeymoon phase. It, you know, the honeymoon phase is when you start and then it right around somewhere around the one third mark, you know, it, it it's, it's a range it's a spectrum. Every story is a little bit different, but somewhere around the one third mark is when things start going off the rails. And what I tell people is that often it's, it think about it like this as a writer, you're like a conductor of an orchestra and you've got to get all of these instruments to play in a harmonious song. So to torture this analogy as much as I can, you've got Go your it. story, you've got your characters, you've got um, minor characters, you've got, you know, the mystery of who done it, that sort of thing. And you're introducing all of that within the first third of the story. Well, once you get to the, the end of that first third, now you have to harmonize all of it. You've got to get it all to play together nicely. And I think subconsciously, you, it's it, when you get stuck there, it's your brain trying to unravel and untangle some of those knots. Mm -hmm. And so the trick, the mental trick is that it's your brain playing tricks on you and it's to continue writing even when you feel bad. It because this phase only lasts for about a few thousand words. And then after that, the sky's clear. And I'm keep torturing the analogy. The music starts playing really nicely and you're off to the races. 
And then, you know, it happens again, you know, periodically throughout the novel, but it's never as bad as it is at that first one third mark. Um, and I've talked to countless writers who, who have experienced the same thing. So um, yeah, I talk about it more in the book. I, I give you some strategies on um, exactly what to do, um, how your, how your brain and your emotions can play tricks on you. Also um, as well as some strategies of, you know, your fingers on the keyboard, exactly what to do when this sort of thing happens. And if you can get through that first third, you can finish the novel. Uh, that's a good reminder that even in those sticky situations, if you just, just, you don't have to push through in this painful way through the entire thing. It's just more of a roadblock. And if you can have the, the foresight to think, okay, no, it's still going to be a book worth writing. Then, then you can do it. You yeah. can get to the end. Well, just remember too, that just because you feel bad about the words that are on the page does not mean that the words that are on the page are bad. It could just be because you didn't get any sleep the night before and you're just in a weird mindset or maybe you didn't eat breakfast or maybe something happened at work or something happened in your personal life that's affecting you in the writing world. And what a lot of people find is that when you get further in the novel and then you come back to those words to review them, they actually weren't that bad. So again, don't let your brain play tricks on you. Just keep going. That's If you can do that, then I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at where you end up. Well, how can people find some of these resources and learn more about you online? Yeah, you can find me at authorlevelup.com. That's where I have the links to all my writing books, my YouTube channel, and everything I'm doing out there in the writing space. And uh, if folks are interested in my fiction, you can find me at michaellaron.com. And that's got links to all my novels. All right. And I'll put those links down below as well. Um, if you want to find out more about Michael or look up his books, his courses, you know, anything that, that has come up in our discussion today. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you talking with me, like I said, at the, at the top of the interview, but that was really informative and it's inspiring to meet somebody who not only writes a lot, but writes for the joy of it, you know, and, and still has all this love for, for what we get to do, you know, as, as writers. So um, like this video, if you like it, make sure to subscribe for more <laughs> of this kind of content um, for indie writing, publishing, uh, life stuff. Um, and I'll see you next week. Good luck with your writing.